good afternoon and thank all of you for being here today. Uh, we are pleased to learn this morning that Congress has passed the $2.3 trillion relief bill uh, that will mean help for many people and businesses across the country and here in Louisiana. Uh, we anticipate that the President will sign that bill into law today. Uh, there will be major resources for hospitals, including funding for grants to cover unreimbursed health care expenses and increased access to digital health care delivery. There's going to be direct checks for families. In addition, there will be small business loans to cover daily operations, including payroll and rent to keep the doors open. Expanded unemployment benefits uh, and training dollars for dislocated workers are included as well. Uh, we know that there is additional assistance for food banks and SNAP benefits to help our most vulnerable citizens. There also will be additional funding for child nutrition programs to make sure that our children still receive meals while they are not attending school. Uh, rest assured that all of our state agencies are combing through the bill um, to make sure that we identify every bit of funding and assistance, flexibility uh, that we can take advantage of. Uh, but let me just say we're very grateful uh, to our congressional delegation for the work that they did in helping to get this important bill passed. Uh, as I just mentioned, we're in the process of studying what the bill contains for Louisiana, but we do know that Louisiana is estimated to get $1.8 billion in direct federal aid uh, from the federal government. We've also been led to believe that that funding could be available to us in as little as 30 days. Obviously, that will be very helpful. Uh, we are one day deeper into this event, and while we don't know what the duration will be, we do know that we are doing everything within our power to respond to this crisis. Uh, and we need everyone, I implore everyone, to do their part as well. Um, staying home, minimizing your travel, minimizing your social contact. Should underscore why slowing the spread of this virus is so important. Indiana has reported 2,746 cases of COVID-19. Now that is 441 cases more than yesterday. That is a 19% increase in the last 24 hours. Now there's some good news and some not so good news. It's a lower number from yesterday's increase of 510, uh, and yesterday's growth was 28%, and today's was 19. But I want you all to keep in mind, today's increase was only from half as many tests. So it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag and what it means, uh, and there's a lot of information that you know, much of which I don't think we actually have um, right now, um, but I've asked my team, including Dr. B, to make sure that we're analyzing these numbers so we can glean as quickly as possible what the trends are. But I can tell you, uh, as of far as what we know, we still remain on uh, the growth curve, that, that the trajectory that we don't like, uh, the one that we need to flatten just as soon as possible. The other news that really there's no way to spin it um, or misinterpret it. Uh, we now have 119 deaths. That's an increase of 36 deaths uh, since our last update. This is the largest n uh, increase in deaths yet uh, to be reported on a daily basis. Yesterday we had 18 deaths. Um, you will also see if you look at the uh, video monitor here that New Orleans has surpassed 1,000 cases. I'd also point out that we now have 200 cases in the four most northwestern parishes. And I point that out just so that everyone understands that this is, in fact, uh, spread all across the state of Louisiana. We have cases in all but nine of our 64 parishes now. And nobody should think that they don't have the virus, the novel coronavirus, or that they don't have COVID-19 in their parishes. Uh, I can assure you it's in every parish, in every community across the state of Louisiana. 
Uh, getting back to the deaths uh, that we have uh, reported uh, up to now, 119 of them, uh, early analysis indicates that uh, conditions among those COVID-19 deaths include uh, diabetes, 41%, uh, kidney disease, 31%, and obesity, 28%. Louisiana is third in the nation per capita for the number of cases. We are second, I believe, per capita in the number of deaths. Obviously, this is a public health emergency as it has been described, um, and it, it shows no signs yet of abating. And I want to encourage everyone to take this extremely seriously. Um, you've heard me say it before, but medical surge is our number one priority in terms of what we as a state are doing. The number one priority in terms of what I'm asking the citizens of our state to do is to minimize the spread by practicing the mitigation measures that we put in place, the social distancing, the stay-at-home order, and so forth. Uh, but on the medical surge part of this, uh, we remain on the, the trend line that we've been on for a few days. Uh, and that is uh, un under current modeling uh, that we would run out of ventilators uh, sometime around April the 2nd or 3rd in Region 1 down around New Orleans for those patients who need ventilators. Uh, just to put into context to people how hard it is to acquire new ventilators, uh, we have put in many days ago um, orders for 12,000 ventilators, uh, I think 5,000 of those from the strategic national stockpile, the remainder from private vendors and manufacturers, and to date we have received exactly 192. Uh, those 192 ventilators have all been allocated uh, and delivered. Um, we do expect the shipment of another 100 early next week, but we need several thousand ventilators. We're going to keep working on this, obviously. Uh, and, and I would remind everybody um, that, that when we overwhelm our capacity, our hospital's capacity to deliver care, it doesn't just threaten COVID-19 patients. It threatens everybody who might need uh, emergency or surgical, I'm sorry, emergency or intensive care uh, at a hospital. Um, whether you're a motor vehicle accident, a heart, heart attack victim, or a stroke victim, or, or whatever. And so I'm asking everyone uh, to do what they can to be a good neighbor, to lower uh, the number of cases that, that we are announcing every day, to start to flatten that curve, um, incredibly important. One piece of relatively good news is that the state of Louisiana is in the top five states on a per capita basis for testing. Uh, and we have surged our testing capacity, our lab throughput um, tremendously. I will not tell you that we're testing in the numbers that we would like. I do anticipate um, that the testing sites, the number of tests administered, the number of test uh, results that we get every day will continue to climb. And, and we need to test all across Louisiana, including in our rural areas. Yesterday, I talked about how we need additional medical staffing today. I'm happy to say that Delta Airlines has offered to fly any healthcare professional volunteers responding to the COVID-19 crisis here in Louisiana for free. Travel will be booked for participants once they have registered and become credentialed through this website, lava.dhh.louisiana.gov. That's lava.dhh.louisiana.gov. Again, before they arrive, they have to register and become credentialed through Louisiana's Volunteers in Action, lava.dhh.louisiana.gov. Once they are credentialed, they will be contacted and given their assignments uh, and instructions on where to report. And I want to thank in advance uh, each of the healthcare professionals who volunteer to come to Louisiana and help with this public health emergency. I also want to make sure, and, and by the way, it sort of frustrates me to have to respond to rumors, but we have to do that on occasion. I want to assure people that we have absolutely no plans to close any state roads or bridges uh, due to COVID-19. As always, for traffic information or other routine road closures, please check 
511LA.org for the latest travel information. 511LA.org. For business owners, in order to answer your questions, the state of Louisiana has established key COVID-19 resources at LED. You'll find an extensive list of links to resources from state and federal government uh, by visiting gov.la.gov slash coronavirus. gov.la.gov slash coronavirus. If you have a non-business question or general inquiry having to do with COVID-19, please dial 211. Call 211. Finally, I must continue to stress how important it is that everyone stay home. The measures that we take from a standpoint Point, or from, I'm sorry, from a state standpoint, can only go so far. The success that we will have in slowing the spread will be dependent upon individuals all across the state of Louisiana. So please, no unnecessary travel. Stay home. Continue to wash your hands frequently and for 20 seconds using soap and water. Use hand sanitizer when you don't have access to soap and water. Cover your cough. Practice social distancing of at, least, of at least six feet between you and someone else if you have to be out and about. If we're going to flatten the curve, if we're going to lessen the burden on our health care system, if we are going to save lives, we must have full cooperation from all Louisianans, and we have to have it now because, quite frankly, we don't have much longer to wait. Uh, April the 2nd, coming up sooner than we would like. So with that, um, I will be happy to take your questions. I will remind you that, again, I have Dr. Alex B.U. here from the Department of Health uh, to take any questions specifically related to testing. Yes, sir. Governor, the Surgeon General this morning said next week, this upcoming week, yeah. New Orleans could see New York-like numbers. Um, from the data you're seeing um, and looking over, is that something that you might agree with, and if so, is that just in the New Orleans area or in other pockets, other swaths yeah. of the state? Well, look, we're number three in the country per capita uh, right now. Uh, the the trajectory on, we're on right now is one that takes us to a place where we're not going to be capable of delivering the health care uh, that will be demanded of our hospitals. Um, so I concur with him um, if, if we stay on this trajectory, and, and you know, it's 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 not that hard uh, to, to understand. It is, it is a very difficult concept to come to grasp with because, because the situation is that serious and that dire, but uh, I, I agree with him. Um, and, and I will tell you, the Surgeon General has made himself available to me specifically on a number of cases, and you remember uh, that he was actually here uh, in Louisiana, and I'm, I'm guessing it was two weeks ago yesterday. Um, it seems like a long, long time ago. But it was just two weeks ago yesterday uh, he was in the state uh, with us. And, and so I, I would have to say that I think he's probably right. Um, but, but what we should start to see very soon, uh, because we know that these mitigation measures work. We know that social distancing works to slow the spread. So, so we really should start seeing that show up in our data. Um, soon, and, and I'm, I'm looking for the day when my team comes to me and they tell me, aha, we, we see that curve start, start to uh, flatten. But until then, we have every reason to believe that we're headed uh, towards New York. Now, uh, the way you ask the questions, we're not going to get to their numbers, but only because we don't have their population. Um, and, and, and the reason that's important and the reason I continue to focus on the per capita numbers, as I have stated before, any state's healthcare delivery system is sized to meet its population. And so if you have the third most cases per capita, uh, then that means that at least at that time, and so long as you're on that trajectory, uh, that you're, you're very likely to exceed uh, your state's capacity to deliver healthcare. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you give an update on the plans with the convention center and what's happening yeah. there and also uh, the field hospitals that are um, yeah. promised from the federal government? Okay. So the, the field hospitals, um, what, what we got, uh, we had requested four 250-bed units. We were approved for two. So this is going to be 500. So these are basically um, hospital cots. I, I don't want to say beds, but they're not, they're not an army cot either. They're somewhere in the middle with IV poles and some other things. Uh, and, and, and they are separate from staffing. 
So we will use those in the Morial Convention Center to set up our medical monitoring facility. And it's going to be very, very helpful to us. Um, that facility will, uh, in fact, they're, they're working there today. Um, and they're going to uh, build this out in wings of 120 rooms each. Uh, they, the the uh, contract will require that they put up 1,120 um, beds uh, in the convention center. And we will then staff uh, that facility uh, primarily through a uh, staffing contract that we are executing uh, here at GOSEP. And then we have wraparound services for uh, cleaning, laundry, uh, food service, um, uh, things of, of that nature. Uh, now, we do have a strike team coming, uh, which are 60 medical professionals from the U.S. Uh, Public Health Service. That will be very, very helpful because we will use them uh, to augment the staffing that we bring in in order to deliver health care uh, in the Morial Convention Center. And, and we are looking at other options as well to increase our, our capacity. Uh, and, and we are looking at, at other facilities and we're looking at other hotels. I don't have any news to uh, deliver to you at this point. Uh, but this is step down capacity. So uh, the idea is that we would have a facility to send uh, patients once they no longer need that acute care bed or an ICU bed uh, and allow the hospitals to free that bed up sooner by having a place to transfer uh, their patients. And that's one additional way that you can serve your medical capacity. So that's, that's what we're intending to do with the field facility that we're, that we're setting up. Uh, we're going to have more information about this uh, soon. You, you can see, um, I think it was, there was some uh, TV coverage today of what they're doing in New York. Uh, the the um, concept, as I understand it, uh, is very, very similar between what we're trying to do here in Louisiana uh, and what they're doing in New York. Yes, sir. Um, can you tell me generally what the state would be getting with the $1.8 billion from the stimulus package? Uh, well, the $1.8 billion in, in, in funding, uh, we should have over at some point in the next 30 days. Uh, we are trying to figure out exactly what flexibility ha we have with that funding. Um, to one degree or another, we know that it's going to have to uh, be spent uh, on those things that, that are related to this COVID-19 public health emergency. But just about everything the state government is doing these days is related to this emergency. Uh, so we are, we are still looking uh, at that. I can only tell you that, that we are very thankful uh, to be getting that because right now, even if we, um, as you know, we, we have the federal government uh, paying 75% of the cost of things that we're doing here uh, at GOSEP and across the state related to COVID-19. Uh, but that's still 25% that we have to come up with. And, and so this will be very helpful in that regard. And, and I will tell you the degree to which um, law enforcement benefits through the, the additional allocation of money going to, through the burn grant program, for example, that's gonna be helpful. The money that goes directly to our hospitals uh, is gonna be helpful as well. We, we just, I, it's too early for me to tell you right now exactly how that money uh, will be spent. I can only tell you that it's, it's going to be very, very helpful. And the more flexibility that we find uh, as we study this bill uh, and as it gets interpreted by the federal agencies administering the program, uh, the better off we're going to be. Yes, sir. My question is for Dr. Bu. Actually, 69 of the folks who have passed so far from COVID-19 were either diabetic or obese, which are both pretty common health conditions in Louisiana, to what degree should the average diabetic or the average person who is overweight be concerned by those numbers? Well, I mean, I, th I think that in general, it's a cause of concern for our population. You've been hearing a pretty consistent message from us that everybody has reason to be concerned and to take actions to protect themselves and their families from COVID-19. We unfortunately announced a death in a 17-year-old yesterday. I mean. We, we know that the people who are at the highest risk are the people who are in the older age group, um, but we also know that people with conditions like, as you're seeing, diabetes, kidney disease, di and, and obesity uh, are also at really high risk for bad outcomes. And so to the extent that we're, you're somebody that has those conditions, we want you to take those steps to really stay at home, have somebody else do the shopping for you, limit your exposure to people who are sick, wash your hands frequently, all those things we've been saying. 
But even if you're not in those groups, we want you to do all those things for the loved ones around you that we know have those conditions. We, we, you know, we want not only to, to not see as many hospital admissions, we want to see <clears throat> the rate of death decrease as well in the state. And the only way we can do that is by taking these measures seriously um, and, and thinking not only about our risk, but the risk to our family and the risk to our neighbors, as you've heard the governor say. Just as a follow-up, were, were those were those 69 people, were they like extremely diabetic, extremely overweight? Do we know the degree of that? So I, I don't know the specifics of each one of those cases. What I'll say is <clears throat> um, I don't think that we're necessarily seeing just extremes. Um, I, I think there's there's reason for everybody uh, with those conditions to, to obviously always take control and, and, and have the optimal health they can. But most importantly right now, to really try to limit access to people who are sick and, and exposure. Um, can you talk about why there are few or no confirmed cases in some of the rural parishes? Those seem like the parishes that are left. Is that because of a lack of prevalence of testing, or is that something specific to the isolation of the parish? No, I think at this point it's largely a function of testing. As we've seen uh, more high volume testing sites, whether they're done by municipality, as we saw in Lafayette, or they're done by hospital systems, as we've seen in other parts of the, the state, um, we start to see not only the places where those, the parishes where those test sites go up, but also the feeding parishes around them uh, go up. And so I think where we see that there's zero cases still, we're concerned we're not seeing people getting tested adequately there. Um, uh, and, and I think that's the case throughout the state. Thank you, Dr. B. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the Florida governor has announced that he is going to start screening people who come in from Louisiana, not just New Orleans, but the whole state, and he's talking about the, the possibility of perhaps setting up some sort of checkpoints to get into the state for drivers. Have you heard anything about that? And what do you think globally about governors like in Texas and Florida dealing with people from our state? Well, first of all, uh, to the degree that, that what they are doing and saying underscores what I'm saying, and that is people need to take this seriously that we have a significant issue here in Louisiana uh, with the case count and the trajectory that we're on in terms of case growth, uh, I think that that is helpful. Uh, I am encouraging people from Louisiana to stay home, so I think that uh, it should be a small number of people uh, who are on the road going into Texas or going in uh, to Florida. So, you know, I've, I've got my hands full here uh, with responding to this crisis, and I'm not going to second guess or criticize uh, what other governors are doing or not doing. Yes, sir. Did the state get any warning or advisories from the CDC before Mardi Gras to indicate either it shouldn't go ahead or any kind of red flag? Or anything I can like tell that? you, I did not. I, 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 and, and Dr. B works at the Office of Public Health uh, at LDH. He did not. If, if I am not mistaken, at the time of Fat Tuesday, there were around 15 cases in the country, all of whom were either uh, tied to direct travel or indirect travel, meaning they had come into the country uh, from one of the hotspots, um, principally China, or they were um, in direct contact with someone who had. And so there was never any suggestion by anyone um, and, and look, I think it's interesting to consider, and I, and I know that there, there are working theories that, that the one and a half million people who, who participated in Mardi Gras and traveled and so forth uh, likely seeded the virus. Um, I, I have to probably correct, but trying to figure out what got here right now isn't as important as everything that we can to minimize the spread. Uh, by surging our medical and so I don't want to take time and attention away from the task at hand uh, in order to discuss what is at present a theory uh, and I'm sure that some student is going to get a doctoral degree one day by doing a dissertation on this yes ma'am um, in terms of the prisons now that we know that uh, that workers at, at at least two state prisons have um, contracted the virus what are you doing in particular in the prison populations to make sure, I mean, they're obviously very tightly mm -hmm. um, congested. What are you doing to make sure that you can limit the spread there? Well, the, as of this morning uh, with the UCG meeting we had via conference call, uh, there are no positive cases in our state prisons in terms of inmates. For inmates, but not the That's correct. And, and people understand that. 
Secondly, we were among the very first states in the nation, if not the first, to discontinue uh, visitation, uh, not just at our prisons, but also at our jails, uh, and, and then um, with hospitals and nursing homes, for example. We know that PPE is going to uh, the prison so that they can care for inmates. Uh, we know that, that people are being uh, screened uh, for health uh, to see if they have symptoms such as a fever and so forth as they come in to go to work. And if they have a fever, they're not allowed uh, to go to work. Uh, they are paying particular care to those inmates who are in those most vulnerable categories, either because of age or chronic health condition or both. Um, and, and so I, I can assure you that, that we're doing everything uh, that we can in order to protect the people that we have in our custody at our state's prisons. Challenge. State of Louisiana. Um, but I'm confident that the work that we're um, doing um, is, is, the, is really commensurate with, with the, the challenge that they, that they face, and, and uh, they're, they're doing a good job. Yes, sir. Um, a few days ago, you were talk, uh, You said you were encouraged by how the public is reacting to mm -hmm. stay-at-home or order other mitigation efforts. Yesterday, talked a little bit about noncompliance. We're heading into the first weekend of your stay-at-home order being in effect. Um, just how critical is it this weekend that people really hunker down? And then I know you've reiterated, but the message for now that people are off work more so that it's a weekend. Yeah, look. Um, Every day is really, really important, and, and we can't do anything about what we did or didn't do yesterday, so I'm asking people to be focused on today, and, and if it helps, I can ask them to be focused on tomorrow, Saturday, and the following day, Sunday, um, but, but this is just something we have to do, and, and we don't really have a choice unless we uh, whether people die who otherwise wouldn't. It's just not how Louisianans behave. That's not what we believe. Uh, we have a long history of dealing with emergencies and disasters and being good neighbors, and, and I fully expect that we're going to do that in this case. And being a good neighbor means you don't have unnecessary contact uh, with one another. And, and whether that's your, your family members or your, your neighbors or friends or whatever, just, just don't do it. And, and uh, I know that this is difficult for people. I know that this is a different way of living than we're accustomed to. But it's just critically important. Um, and, and we are going to get through this. Exactly when, I can't tell you. And exactly what shape, I cannot tell you. But I can tell you it will be faster and better uh, if more people uh, comply. And there are an awful lot of, of Louisianans out there doing their part. But we, we know that we can do better. Out trials on tests that might be available in as, in as little as 30 minutes. And, boy, that would be great. Um, you know, I, I think that... Uh, for example, we were told three to five days before the individual's testing at the three drive-up uh, federally supported uh, testing sites, two in New Orleans and one in Jefferson. And we would really like that to happen faster. We do believe that those test results are coming in. And you may recall that uh, I think it was New Orleans set up their two test sites a week ago today, um, and Jefferson set up, it, set up its site a week ago tomorrow. Uh, and it was a three to five day um, uh, lag time between uh, having your sample collected and having the test results made available to you. And we are starting to see uh, the to those individuals. Obviously, just like we want to have the uh, increase our capacity for the collection of specimens to be tested and the throughput tabs and the the, the time uh, to a test is taken and the results are known and communicated, all of these things are improving uh, tremendously over time. We are where we want to be when you look at this map and that information on it. And so we always want to be better. Uh, and we are working on that uh, every single day. I am heartened by the fact that we have the fifth most tests um, in the basis uh, that that we are working to improve our test and so forth uh, because we don't like knowing and the more tests you administer the more you know the easier it is to convince people who who need to uh, to stay home 
uh, you know, to actually do that. I'll mention again what, I, what I've said a couple times before. One of the reasons uh, struggling to, to flatten the curve and it was able to do it is they were able to ramp up their testing much quicker. Uh, and, and they did it. In, and so they were able to, to uh, buy more of their population who had the virus and get them to stay home. Well, our testing is to stay home who haven't been told they have the virus. It's it hard, but that's essential. And so, so the mitigation measure, the stay home order becomes a proxy for slow to ramp up. And when I say we, across the United States, and I think everyone, uh, that this is not, this wasn't uh, done as well as we would have liked it to have been done uh, early on. But testing is improving over time, and that's going Look, I'm going to I'm going to cut it off there. Uh we will let you know when the next uh press uh conference is going to be, but we are we're thinking that's going to be when, Shauna? Um, okay. Working tomorrow. So if you're working <laughs> tomorrow, uh we will likely have another press conference uh tomorrow. But thank you for the job that you're doing uh in order to allow us to better communicate to the uh and while I have the cameras rolling, I'm just going to ask you I'm going to urge you, I'm going to implore you one more time. Do your part. Stay home, slow the spread, save lives, and, and offer up a prayer uh, for those whose lives have been taken and their families and, and for those who are afflicted by this disease now that they will, they will be granted recovery and for everybody in the state that we will find uh, the ability to do our part. God bless and thank you.